Let's, uh, let's open up our Bibles this morning and um, let's turn to Zechariah chapter 8. We will do our absolute best to, to bring across God's Word to you this morning. Hey, when we look in the Old Testament and we look at um, some minor prophets here, we really need to understand uh, some foundational things of what's happening. Because if we just jump into a story and we're not really sure with the culture and the time and the setting that it's being shared with us, I think we're going to miss a lot of the points right here. I'm going to read a portion of Zechariah chapter 8 in a little bit. And once I lay a foundation, then some of the terminology that it shares in there will make a lot more sense. And so at this point in the story, in Zechariah and Haggai at that time, uh, the Jews had returned back to the promised land because they had been in captivity for 70 years. Um, Selfishness uh, was crippling into the community. Uh, The general mood of the period was gloomy and dismal, even though they were free. Isn't that just an interesting thought? Even though we have been set free, sometimes we live in a season or a time where it seems dismal and gloomy. Uh, They returned to the city walls being completely in ruins. The temple of God remained in a big rubble heap, uh, drought and disease. It really ravaged the land at that time. Then you've got God's prophetic people come in Haggai and Zechariah at that time again, calling the people not to work harder, not to work smarter, not to put in more time, but he's calling them to something. I want to share that with you in just a sec. But Zechariah and Haggai also just weren't kind of like, well, we'll be over here and we'll just tell you what the Lord's doing. No, they actually pulled up their sleeves and started chipping in. And I love this idea that we're all called to serve in some capacity. So if we went back to Ezra chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Now Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet, the descendant of Edu, prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, who was in charge, sent to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them and helping them. You know, sometimes we need some spiritual advice and some spiritual wisdom. And sometimes I just I actually just need some help. Would you just come over to my house? Would you come and support me in whatever the way is? Would you come into the hospital and visit me? And sometimes there's just a physical thing we need to do. Again, the prophets were willing to roll up their sleeves. But their message to the people was always the same as the message of God is always the same. We need to spiritually renew ourselves. We need to rebuild this temple. We need to restore you know, Christ as the head. God is the head at that point. We don't restore political or all those things precede God. God's presence is the key to restoration. It wasn't like, hey, if we get all these walls built, if we get the church built, again, the temple built, then God will come into it. Until then, if there's rubble, you know, God's not going to like dirtiness. God doesn't like walls that aren't finished or fences that are half done. And it doesn't say that at all. God is like, I'm there with you all the time no matter what's going on in your life. You don't have to clean house. And sometimes we think of the communion elements in the same capacity. Well, hey, if I get my life in order, then I'll feel worthy to receive them. Well, it's, you're never going to receive the elements because you'll never feel that you've cleaned up enough because there's always something in your life because we're not perfect and that's just reality. And so we've got to understand that. So they needed to make sure that the priority was, again, in focusing on the Lord, not waiting. We'll fix everything before we get back to the God, to be back to God, sorry. The problem they faced was for many good reasons. If you think about as the people returned to a scattered urban landscape uh, where considerable effort was needed to simply survive, you know, they're back in the promise, which is now the destroyed land. This milk and honey is gone, though. And so you're just trying to live day to day, little bone about like thriving in there. Where considerable effort was needed, again, just to survive, because when they left, only 30% of the people came back. 70% of the people were gone-ish. You know, we can wrestle through that if you want. The community was struggling to rebuild a sustainable economy, let alone worry about the Lord's temple. And I almost think that it becomes an unrealistic task. And we think... That's just not even going to happen. I, I can't even scrounge to find food, little think about taking care of my own house and my own family and my own situation, than thinking about 
the Lord's house. How do I even have time for that? And so that's, that's the environment that we're in in this situation. The reason both Haggai and Zechariah were reminding the audiences again that God controls even the resources. So if we think like, I, I'm not going to have enough, I can't find enough, I need to worry about me. I'm going to work really hard to get all my resources together to be able to build these things. And God is saying, Zechariah is saying, let's put our eyes on the Lord who is overseeing all the resources and he will provide as he always does. I think similarly, let's be really gentle. I mean, that time is like unbelievably difficult. Ours is not even close, but let me create some kind of similarity to that. When we come out of restriction time, we come into a housing market and a cost of borrowing money at it like an obscenely high rate. We see the medical system is in trouble. We see the cost of food and fuel. Like I'm like, ah, you know, trying to fill up my vehicle. We see the labor shortage. And what do we do? And so if there's any similarity to that, there's a concern in our community. And so what do we do about it? We do the same thing that we've done, that we've always done for thousands of years. We continue to put our full trust in God because he's our provider. Because we don't have to worry about what's going on in the world because we have a confidence in our God that it doesn't, you know, waver him. It's not a surprise to him. He's just consistent and faithful the whole way. Even if we walk into something that's broken, God's like, I'm there with you. Let's build this thing. Even if you walk into something that's the promised land, he's there with you. And so whatever season of life you're in, you can have confidence in that, whether it's great or whether it's a challenge right now, God is there with you and we can trust him. He is trustworthy. So we can see a bit of some foundation there before we read Zechariah chapter 8. I want to go back just even one chapter, so Zechariah chapter 7 as well. And let me just read it to you because the people of God, they come back to this land and it's just, it's broken. They're focused on themselves. It's not healthy. And so we would read something like this in Zechariah seven eleven. But they refused to pay attention. Stubbornly, they turned their backs and stopped up their ears. They made their hearts as hard as flint and would not listen to the law or the words that the Lord Almighty had sent by his spirit through the earlier prophets. So the Lord Almighty was, he's not a happy camper. When I called, they did not listen. So when they called, I would not listen, says the Lord Almighty. I scattered them with a whirlwind among all nations where they were strangers. The land was left so desolate behind them that no one could come or go. This is how they made the pleasant land desolate. They made that promised land a mess so that when they came back, it wasn't the promised land anymore. And the people were upset about that. And they, they were not happy campers about that. And so often we get our eyes off of the Lord. And we think that, oh, the Lord can't hear me anymore. I've made too many poor decisions. You know, that's it. You know, strike three, I'm out. And we see here, we might live in <clears throat> Zechariah chapter 7. But the good news is there's Zechariah chapter 8 in our Bible. There's good news that when we open it together and we see we're, we're, we're a stubborn people. We don't listen to the Lord. We've got hard hearts. And then the very next chapter, most subheadings and most Bibles will say this. The Lord promises to bless them. Even though they're stubborn and hard-hearted and don't follow my laws. Like, thank you, God. That the next chapter isn't about, you know, hell and damnation. The next chapter is about redemption and restoration. And that's the kind of Bible that we have. That's the kind of good news that we read. And I've said this to you many times. If it didn't say that... I would not stand here in front of you. If it was just about like, if you don't smarten up and shape up, you're out. Like if that's what it taught, I would have quit a long time ago. But it does say that, hey, when you make mistakes, God's faithful and he'll bless you. He'll take care of you. Oh, that's just great news. I need to hear that all day long. Because I am far from perfect. You don't need to ask my wife or the board or, you know, my kids or anything. We all know it. It's all good. We're all in the same boat together here of unperfection. But we have chapter 8 of the world. So let's read it because it's so exciting. And then we'll, dice, we'll look at it a little bit in depth. So Zechariah chapter 8, we'll jump in verse 16. So you've got a bit of a taste of what the, the culture and the time was like. These are the things that you're to do. <clears throat> Speak the truth to each other and render true and sound judgment in your courts. Do not plot evil against your neighbor and do not love to swear falsely. I hate all this, declares the Lord. 
Again, the word of the Lord Almighty came to me. This is what the Lord Almighty says. The fast of the fourth, fifth, seventh, and tenth months will be joyful and glad occasions and happy festivals for you. Therefore, love, truth, and peace. It says that because it wasn't happy times. The people were very unhappy. And God says there's a time coming where the joy of the Lord is about to return. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Many peoples and the inhabitants of many cities will yet come. And the inhabitants of one city will go to another and say, let us go and entreat. This word means let us go and let's pray. Let us go and bless. Let us go and ask favor of the Lord and seek the Lord Almighty. I myself am going. And many peoples and powerful nations will come to Jerusalem to seek the Lord Almighty and to entreat him again and to bless him and to pray to him and ask for God's favor upon their lives. In verse 23, this is what the Lord Almighty says. In those days, ten men from all languages and nations will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe. Oh, look at prophetically and say, let us go up with you because we have heard that God is with you. When you find people that are with God, You want to be close to them. I want to just look at a couple of these verses in depth because there is so much. It was so hard to create this message, knowing that there's communion and there's grad quilts. And I'm like, I just want to say it all. And I've had to cut out like so many pages. So we'll try and stay on track. I might go on down some rabbit trails, but we'll be okay. Verse 19. This is what the Lord Almighty says. It's a direct answer to the question that was asked in Zechariah 7.3. Zechariah 7.3 says, By asking the priests of the house of the Lord Almighty and the prophets, should I mourn and fast in the fifth month as I have done for so many years? Like, I am sick and tired of doing these fasts. Like, I am not good. Look at my house. Look at the church. This thing is just a complete mess. I am tired of doing this. This is our heart and heart in chapter 7, remember. But then we see in chapter 8 the answer to that in verse 19. I know it's a mess. I know it's not good. I know that there's negativity and selfishness going all around. But watch what happens. The fast in the 4th, 5th, and 7th, and 10th months will become joyful, glad occasions, and happy festivals for Judah. Love, truth, and peace. Thank you, Lord. These people were stubborn. How much longer do I have to do this, Lord? I'm sick of this. Tired. There's nothing. I don't feel any blessing. I don't feel anything. And God is saying, it's going to be good. It's going to be very good. And so we're going to keep reading and looking at more of how great it will be like. And so in verse 20, we'll see this. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Many peoples and the inhabitants of many cities will come. Tons of people are going to come says the Lord Almighty. And they're just looking at like, are you kidding me? This land is desolate. The people have moved on. There's nothing here worth a nickel. Everyone's checked out. The place is in rubble. It's just a mess. They've gone wherever the, the milk and the honey is. And God is saying, this place is going to be like milk and honey again. Because they will come. I know we're in Zechariah and rubbles, but we have the rest of the Bible. They didn't. But we do. We know how it ends. Jerusalem becomes a great place. People from all nations came together and looked at the wealth and the grandeur of Jerusalem. And it's not only like a few like ignorant people that they kind of twisted their arm to come. It wasn't some idle people that were like, well, there's nothing else to do around here. Might as well go to the Jerusalem and check out the church. Uh, but intelligent, inquisitive people people of business, and and they invited their colleagues from all around the world. These kind of people will embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ as well. Sometimes you hear my story so often, you're thinking, well, you're a hooligan anyways. You needed Jesus. Well, you are true in that one. But very, very educated and intelligent people need Jesus as well. People that had maybe a a kind of a a nice upbringing, I wouldn't say like a cushy upbringing, they need Jesus as well. And so Jesus and the gospel and the truth is not just for like the really hurting and downright. Well, like people would say to me when I try and witness to them, they say, well, when I'm hurting, when I need help like a doctor, I'll come then. Hmm. Leave that alone. Verse 22. And many peoples and powerful nations will come to Jerusalem and seek the Lord Almighty and entreat him. Again, 
Pray to him and bless him. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In those days, ten men from all languages and nations will take hold uh, of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, let us go with you because we have heard that God is with you. I want to just kind of look at that for a few minutes here because there's, that's a lot of moving parts in that statement there. That many peoples and powerful nations is the first statement in verse 22. From all language, languages will be brought into the church. Not by human persuasion. Like, I, I guess, I don't know, ethnicity and cultures. So you can only reach so many people in a sense personally. For they are, again, different languages. I don't know different languages. I remember when I was up north in Yukon for um, pastoring for many, many years. Uh, we did multiple services because it was a small church facility. And one of the services happened to just turn into this uh, cultural service. And I was preaching in the morning service. It was like I was speaking to my leaders, so I could just be kind of a little bit harder to them. They're like, you know, you can, you know, these are good Christian people. They can take it a little bit harder. Uh, in the afternoon, it was kind of like families. Their kids went to Sunday school. But then in the late afternoon, it was this kind of multicultural service. And I said, when I was a kid, I used to act like a Yahoo. And I just felt like they're all like, what does that mean? And so they thought I meant like, Yahoo! Because culturally, they don't understand that. And I'm like, no, Yahoo! Like bad. And so I had to kind of re-communicate what I was saying. And God is saying here as well that it's not about people that will draw all these men to himself from powerful nations. But it's actually his presence that will draw people. We're often so encouraged, and I guess we do this in just reality, like, how many people go to your church? It's usually a question I get from district office or whatever, and we would share numbers with you. But it's not for my sake. It's not for the church's sake. It's not for some record book. It's for God's sake. Thank God that God is drawing people to himself, his church, for his sake. I pray in Jesus' name, we pray this often as leaders, that all churches in Terrace would grow and thrive and fill up so that God would be glorified. Not one building, not one pastor. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with what God's doing. When somebody comes and you felt drawn maybe to come to this church because God was drawing you. Again, it wasn't the, the nice homemade wafers. Those are very good. I just need to go back there for a minute. But... If that's the only reason you came. Oh man, there's some couple leftovers for you. Thank God for, you know, those kind of people. Anyways, rabbit trail, 23, going back. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In those days, 10 men from all languages and nations will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe. What does, oh, that's just so good. I love that. See, in Near Eastern time, at that point in history... Grasping the hem or the robe of somebody uh, meant that it usually was worn and it, the tassels were down low. For you to be able to grab hold of that usually meant that you had to get low. You had to be able to get down to grab it. And so do you see the imagery there? That we have to come humbly to our God so that we can take hold of his garment. And upon the other person, as Jesus said when the woman, I just even pray, just prayed that this morning too, as a woman came and just touched the hem of his garment because she was bleeding all the time, God said, hey, there's some power that came out of me because there was humility and faith that if I could just touch, something would happen. Do we approach God that way? Do we come to the communion table that way thinking, if I could just touch, if I could just receive from the Lord, something wonderful would happen in my life. These men are begging, in a sense, the Jew to take them with them. Let, let us go with you, because we have heard that God is with you. And that indicates that there's great honor towards this person. We would show great reverence towards that person. You wouldn't get on your knees in front of somebody you had no, you didn't care about, or you thought was somebody of great honor and value. You'd be like, I'm not getting on my knees with this chump. You know, this is about humility to somebody. Like, I will come and I will submit under you. As the Jew was one of the God's chosen people at that time, he was worthy to be in acquaintance with. And if you think about the way it's written there as well, that, that ten men from all languages and nations will take firm hold 
of a hem of his robe. It doesn't say that they'll come and shake his hand. It doesn't say that they'll come and give him a nice hug. There's so many people that are coming to the Lord and say, if I could just, just, just touch a bit of it, I would be satisfied. We talk about that so often about the Word of God that there's places in the world where they smuggle in just a page into places so people can just, just get a touch of the Lord. And when they have that touch of the Lord brings salvation to them. It brings hope and freedom to them because they can just just get a sense of God. That's just a deep thought there. But where ambition or ambitious takes hold, as we ambitiously take hold of the garment, we're expecting something, aren't we? We're desperate for God. I don't know at what point in your life you got to a place where you're like, I am, I'm on my knees. I'm so broken. I'm so desperate. I just anything, God, just... Just the scraps from your table I'd be happy with right now because I am so desperate for a move of the Lord. Let us go with you because we've heard that God's with you. A desperation, like we want to go where God is. We found this person who is godly. Let's go with them. Are we okay today just getting by on our own day to day? Are we concerned with our own affairs? So often I can easily turn a blind eye and just be like focused on the day and all the activities and the things I'm supposed to do and really neglect or forget about the Lord. And these were the things that were happening at that time. And God says, there is a season that is coming. When you humble yourself and you grab hold of me, there is a season, there's a time of blessing coming, even though it was in turmoil, even though it was crazy. And so I just pray that over us as a church, that as we come today, whatever we're facing, that we know that there is good things in store for us that know him. Because we are, we're humble, we're desperate for a move of God. God wants to meet us right where we're at. Again, let's get our eyes off of our circumstances and our situations that are here. Let's get our eyes upon him because he is worthy. He is so trustworthy. So whatever we're facing today, just know that there's a good season coming as we read here we might be in chapter seven but keep reading you got chapter eight coming just around the corner and so isn't that just wonderful news i love the old testament it's brilliant stuff so let me just pray with you and then we'll we'll close and we'll sing one more time together so this morning father we're grateful for the word of god father we're thankful for the truth and the authority and power that it carries And Lord, I don't know where where everybody's at this morning. I could sense even during communion that you were doing something in in people's lives. And so whatever needs to take place this morning, we're thankful that you are doing it. You're personally interacting with every person here. You're personally concerned with the affairs of where everybody's at this morning, whether they're in chapter 8 and things are great. Or they're in chapter 7, and and there's some difficult things they're facing. Father, I thank you that you're in both places. So thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for ministering to us this morning. We want to show you awe and reverence. We want to get on our knees in a sense because we are desperate for Jesus. We're desperate for God. We're desperate for you, Holy Spirit. So thank you for answering our questions as they did. They asked How long, God, are we going to have to do this till I see some freedom and some peace in my heart? And so, God, we ask the same thing, God. We want to see you move. We want to see you heal. We want to see you bring peace. In Jesus' name, we thank you and honor you this morning. Amen.